It's Spencer Hughes, and we welcome back one of my favorite guests. This is his third time, and I look back at other guests I've had. I don't think I've ever had a guest on a third time. I've had some twice, but that's how much I love David Aguilar. He's an astronomer, an artist, an author. I've read just about all of his books, I think, unless he has some new ones since the last time I I caught up. And we have him on for one specific book today, and that's how we're going to do these interviews. I think it's more fun when we focus on one book each time. And this is a wonderful book from uh, Smithsonian and uh, Viking Public cosmic catastrophes seven ways to destroy a planet like earth david welcome back good to have you spencer it's great to be here well thanks so much i enjoyed this and i felt like a kid all over again because of your wonderful wonderful artwork which at the end of this book by the way you give kind of an inside look you reveal some of your secrets on how you do some of this graphic art and i'm still blown away you you show us the step by step and i'm still lost so that's what kind of a dummy I am. You're showing us how to do it. And I'm still like, I cannot believe he, he does all this art in his books. <laughs> Great job. Oh, it's a lot of fun. It really is. It's really cool. Well, I uh, thought this was perfect timing when you wanted to talk about this, because since we uh, booked this interview a while back, the family said, do you want to see Don't Look Up? And I go, I don't even know what that is. What is it? And they said, Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm not the biggest Leonardo DiCaprio fan, but I like him in some things. And you know, I gave it a shot. And I know a lot of people that didn't like that movie at all. I really enjoyed it. It's actually up for four Academy Awards, including Best Picture. And it's about uh, an asteroid, basically, that's on a collision course with the Earth and the X number of months that the Earth has to prepare to try to destroy this thing before it wipes out humanity. And it makes the... um, the one that wiped out the dinosaurs, as Terrence McKenna used to say, look like a nothing burger in comparison. Did you see that movie, David? Yeah, I sure did. And it split our family, too. Part of the family uh, didn't care for it. And uh, I loved it. I thought it was great. And it was funny as heck. I mean, it was written to be kind of satirical, but it was really powerful, I thought, because in the end, you're looking at it going, wow, this is probably exactly how it would play out, sadly. The media, you know, I've been in the media for 30 years now, and I hate to say it, that's how the media works with those talk show hosts on the TV. And all they care about is ratings and all they care about is pandering to the public and It was just really, really, uh, I thought it hit the nail on the head in in the way the government would deal with it and the exploitation of the minerals or whatever was in the the asteroid that was going to hit. So instead of trying to deflect the asteroid, the money grubbers in the private sector and in the government say, hey, wait a minute, maybe we ought to just take a chance, let this thing hit us maybe, or we'll we'll mine it before it hits us and we'll take everything we need from it. I I just, I was... um, no pun intended, blown away by that. How realistic was that movie, uh, in your opinion, as someone who's actually, you know, got the astronomy background and the science credentials? It it was realistic in the sense that there is something like this that could happen to us, and it would be picked up by scientists, but they would have had a much broader coalition behind them, uh, trying to enforce and let the government know what was about to happen. Actually, this movie has has been called a... uh, uh, a front for climate change because of the way the world is reacting to climate change and the deniers and the deflectors. And so what they really did is, is take the possibility of, of something hitting the earth and play it out to show what it would look like when the government really paid no attention to it at all. And that's what they felt was going on about climate change right now, which is just as threatening to humans and to most of the creatures on the planet right now. So that is um, a distinct possibility for, for one of the ways to destroy a planet like earth. And so that's why I think it got some people's attention. And most people want the government to stand up and the scientists to stand up and immediately send a rocket that takes care of it and problem solved. But that's right. not the way it really works in the world today. Yeah, I thought it was just so powerful. And even at the end, I thought to myself, what would people do? And I thought uh, there were a lot of people, I think, um, that I talked to who saw that movie, they kind of laughed off the ending. But I thought that ending was really underappreciated. I think it was a very powerful ending because what else are you supposed to do? I mean, we have Mount Rainier an hour and a half from where we live. That's one of uh, the active volcanoes in Washington state. That thing could probably obliterate a good chunk of Washington in the Pacific Northwest if that thing blows. But you can prepare kind of for a volcano. 
you know, you can go underground, you can do all this stuff. But when something that big hits the earth, you're pretty much wiped out. There's there's no storm cellar that's going to protect you from something that big hitting the earth. And I wondered myself, what would I do? What my, would my family do? And I think we would have done exactly what uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's family did in that movie where they're all gathered around. And it was so, uh, look, I'm not going to ruin it for people. There's a spoiler alert here, okay? The spoiler alert, you can turn down the volume if you don't want to hear it. The asteroid hits the Earth. Okay, anyway. So they're, get, they're preparing for impact, and the tables start shaking, and, and lights start getting brighter outside. I, I imagine that feels like that's what it would be like in the final moments when you say, this is it, right? I mean, what, what else are you going to do? It's that proverbial million-dollar question. What would you do when you only have you know an hour left to live or something? Well, you know, there's that other group that thinks death is the greatest uh, thrill of all. That's why they save it for last. I'd never heard that before. That's awesome. Well, it's funny because one of the, uh, well, the first scenario, what I, the way I would describe this book is you have these seven ways and you, you dive into all of them on ways that the earth could reach some sort of a cataclysmic climax from asteroids and comets to even aliens, which I loved. And tell us if you could a little bit about the difference between the comet swarm scenario and like an asteroid hitting because a lot of us are confused. We look up into the sky and we see the little wispy tails and shooting stars. We call them shooting stars. I don't even know if that's what they are. What are some of the differences? We need to fear what more, an asteroid or a comet? Yes. <laughs> I love your answers. <laughs> yes, next <That's> question. Awesome. <laughs> now, just looking at it, can the untrained eye really know the difference like when i see something like a shooting star i just in my mind i'm thinking that's a meteor right we have meteor showers we never hear people in the uh in the the, the weather forecast are saying we're gonna have a, a comet shower tonight and they don't say we're gonna have an asteroid shower they say it's a meteor shower yeah is that interchangeable to help us differentiate these terms meteor asteroid comet the meteors are tiny little particles that uh, mostly burn up in our atmosphere. They're small. Okay. And if you see a little streak across the sky, it's space debris. It's probably about the size of a, a BB or a pea. It's not much larger than that. And it's burned up before it hits the ground. It takes a fairly substantial large object, at least the size of a football, to make it through the Earth's atmosphere and to hit the ground. And yeah, they can come through the roof of your house, they can hit your car, which can cause a little bit of damage. But when we're talking about asteroids, these are very large, large rocks that orbit around the Earth. The Earth goes through a swarm of asteroids that surround us right now. And some of these things are, you know, the size of uh, the state of New York or larger. I mean, they're huge. If one of those were to hit, that's catastrophic for us. And that's just ask the dinosaurs because that's what happened to them. And that one was about the size of Manhattan when it hit. And it, um, it almost sterilized the earth. As 70% of all life disappeared on the surface of the earth. And that's from trees to grasses to animals to birds to insects. All of them were gone. So that's an asteroid. And they, they swarm around us all the time. And we're monitoring them because we realize this could happen. So there's a group in NASA that maps every one of these large objects. But these are the really big ones. These are at least a mile in diameter or larger. And occasionally, one of these smaller ones that could cause a lot of damage sneaks through. And we pick it up a few days before it gets here. And we can watch it as it, it passes by the Earth. Comets, on the other hand, come from much deeper, further away in our solar system. They're out beyond Jupiter. They're out beyond Pluto. A lot of them, when they start their journey in towards the sun, and we can see them out there because they begin growing a tail. It's like, hey, everybody, look at me. Here I am. I'm coming. <laughs> hey, pay attention to me. And that's what they found in uh, in the movie. And as this comet gets closer, the tail grows longer. It's millions of miles in length behind it. And it glows wow. sunlight. So we can see these things. Usually when they're out near Jupiter, uh, Comet hale bopp that beautiful comet we had decades ago, came from, we spotted it beyond Jupiter. So we had months literally before, almost a year before it ever reached uh, the position of the Earth and the sun that we might have to, to worry about it. So. Comets can be seen further out, and they can they can give us a little preparation time to do something about it. 
Asteroids come quicker and faster. We're mapping them as quickly as we possibly can, but there could always be a surprise. And uh, then the little meteors that we see are just space debris left over that really is, is harmless. Although for all of you out there on a diet, you think you're having a problem with the pandemic of keeping the weight off. Think about the earth. It gains over a ton in weight every day from all of these little micrometeorites filtering down onto the surface. Wow. Now, what does that do over time, David? Is that something to worry about? I mean, uh, does no, that, called- is that just like a, a little insect on an elephant's back or what? No, it, yeah, it, it makes no difference whatsoever, but there's a very good chance that the dust you pick up off the top of your refrigerator, if you're inclined to do that, or the windowsill may have filtered down from outer space. It's not just dust here on the earth. Wow. Cause we, we, we live out in the country and we've got a lot of dust from the dogs coming in and stuff, but I'd like to think it's not from the dogs. If I could think it's from outer space, that would be pretty awesome. <laughs> I, I, I just wipe some down right now and that could be space debris. It, so it, could, be, <laughs> it could be worth something to somebody. You never know. Oh my goodness. Now, one chapter that kind of worried me a little bit was this throwing us out of the solar system. Uh, Can you describe that scenario, cataclysmic scenario? Because that sounds really catastrophic and it sounds like uh, not something we want to have happen anytime soon. How uh, How does a planet, let's say like Earth, get thrown out of the solar system? That sounds terrifying. Well, it would be. It'd be kind of interesting, too. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Hey, look, we're leaving and we mean it. But uh, (laughs) we have a lot of objects that that pass by the sun and pass by our solar system. And uh, some of them are stars. Some of them are small uh, rogue stars that are traveling through space. Some of them are, are rogue planets that have been thrown out of their own solar system. So it's not just an empty vacuum out there. And there's a good chance that occasionally, uh, since we see these rogue planets traveling among the stars by themselves, that something big passed by their planet and pushed the smaller uh, planets out of their orbits and just sent them reeling into space. Uh, When you think of the solar system, our neighborhood, the planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, we think of them as in racetracks isolated from each other and they never get near each other or influence each other too much. But that's not true. Planets move around all the time. And we're finding solar systems where giant planets like Jupiter have left their orbit and are soon going to crash into their sun. But as they moved in towards their star, anything that was in their way, like a planet like Earth or Mars or Venus, They got shoved either out into space or into the star itself. So this is quite common. Objects, planets, passing stars will uh, perturb a whole solar system and planets get thrown out. Now, it's okay if we leave with our sun. We'll be all right. It'll just be the sun and us traveling through space. But if we get separated from our star, the Earth freezes. That's it. It goes dark. And that could very well happen. So it would be like nighttime, but on... Every part of the earth, every, every country on earth would have darkness at the same time, right? It would be like nighttime in Antarctica in the winter. Wow. And that's okay. I guess for the first couple of days, we could probably be fine. But after a few weeks or months, how long would it take of perpetual nighttime for the whole planet before things would start uh, going sideways? Well, you're going to freeze all the water on the surface. The temperature is going to drop to eventually, not not immediately, because we have the core of the Earth that's still kicking out heat. Uh, it would be pretty uncomfortable for, for decades to come. And uh, we'd be tapping into maybe geothermal power. We'd be hoping a few volcanoes would go off to keep us going. But <laughs> things would get pretty grim here on the Earth. It, it would get cold. Yeah, when we're praying for volcanoes to erupt, you know, we're just in um, a massive amount of of danger, (laughs) danger, Will Robinson. Uh, One um, thing that I've never really wrapped my head around, and I know someone like you could explain it, supernova. So that's basically what, a star that collapses under pressure or something? Is that what a supernova is? And then it, it explodes or something? Or if you could explain to us, in layman's terms, what a supernova is, because that's one of the scenarios you have in the book as well, a supernova exploding. A supernova is a very large star, uh, a giant star. And and these are so huge. I know it's difficult to imagine this. Uh, Our sun is 
almost a million miles in diameter, not quite. And we live 93 million miles away. So uh, it would take 90, 93 suns stacked up edge to edge to reach the earth from the center. But we see some of these giant stars that aren't a million miles in diameter. Their diameter reaches all the way out to the orbit of Jupiter. I mean, these are monsters. And they wow. burn through their fuel very quickly. They're rare. We don't we see uh, in comparison to other stars like our sun, which is a happy little medium-sized star that, that lives for about 13 billion years and just, just pokes along and makes everything happy on Earth. These things live a very short period of time, uh, measured in, in millions of years instead of billions of years. And they are burning through their fuel like a, you know, a kid with a foot down on the gas pedal uh, going down the highway at 150 miles an hour. They are just ripping through their, their fuel that makes them burn. And when they've gone through all of that fuel, they literally collapse. And as they collapse, they heat up. It gets hotter and hotter and hotter until it reaches a, a temperature that is so hot, it literally explodes. And that throws all that material back out into space. We see them light up in the sky. They're gorgeous. They last a few million years in brightness, and then they dim down and disappear. We don't see them any longer. But it's a massive star that has collapsed in upon itself, grown so hot, it literally blows up. So how far away have these been to the Earth? And what kind of an effect would it have if it was, I mean, how close is too close for one of these things to go off in relation to the earth and how it would affect us to possibly devastate us? Well, it, it, it depends. I mean, we have some potential stars that are very close to the earth right now that could become a supernova. One of them is Betelgeuse. It's on the uh, right shoulder of Orion the Hunter. When you, you see uh, Orion the Hunter up in the sky, he's in a winter sky right now with the three stars that form his belt. Well, his right shoulder is an orange colored star named Betelgeuse. It's ready to go. It could collapse at any time and it could send radiation our way. We've looked back in the annals of history to the, the five great mass extinctions that have happened here on earth. And we believe at least one of them may have been caused by a supernova. And what's interesting for us uh, astrophotographers who go out at night with our cameras and photograph the sky, we can photograph three or four remnants of supernova that have exploded in the last hundred million years. So it is common. It just depends, the luck of the draw, how close you are to one of these monster stars that uh, that runs out of fuel and bang, it's gone. So Betelgeuse is, is a, a possible threat to the Earth to send deadly radiation through space that literally sterilizes the surface of a planet. I just saw this on the wires a couple of hours uh, before we sat down to chat, and I want to get your take on this, then we'll come back to the book. But this is an interesting thing uh, to have happen while I'm talking to a a world-renowned astronomer. Uh, Geomagnetic storm sends 40 SpaceX satellites plummeting to Earth. They say that they'll probably burn up completely upon reentry. Is this, how common are these geomagnetic storms? And is that, is that, it sounds pretty devastating to me that they launched 60 of these things uh, from Cape Canaveral in October of 2020. And it looks like 40 are plummeting down to earth because of a geomagnetic storm. What the heck is a geomagnetic storm? And uh, what other kind of satellites could it, could it disable? I mean, could it di- disable potentially military satellites? I mean, uh, cell phone signals. I mean, what, what can these storms do? Oh, sure. They're, 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 uh, they originate on the sun. And there's a big sunspot group that is on the sun right now. And that's where these big solar flares come out of. They, the energy travels through space. It hits our magnetic field that surrounds the Earth, lights it up with aurora. And that's why in the last couple of weeks, we've seen the aurora in the northern hemisphere light up the sky. It's been quite spectacular because we've had some of these, uh, these solar storms sending uh, highly charged particles our way. Now, This is something that that we need to be aware of, because as we put more objects into outer space, all of our communications, uh, all of these different things that we put out there, yes, we are vulnerable to some of these solar storms that may knock equipment out. We were lucky 
because the Apollo astronauts were totally unprotected when they walked around the surface of the moon. And if there had been a gigantic solar flare that had reached the moon, their little space capsules would not have been enough to uh, give them protection from all of that radiation coming down. And so it does strike the Earth. Uh, I, I don't feel too bad for Elon Musk and the spacecraft satellite because I've seen these things launched and it looks like a railroad train going across the sky. And there is a huge, huge debate going on right now between the science community, governments that regulate these satellites going up, and private companies that want to launch literally tens of thousands of these satellites in orbit for their business ventures. Because two things can happen. One, astronomers today are having difficulty photographing the sky. There's too many satellites going through their pictures. Wow. I've taken, a, I've taken a five minute picture when I've gone out at night and I have seven satellites go through it. Wow. So, I never so thought about that. So that's destroying data. But if you ever saw the movie Gravity, back to movies again, it's very possible that one of these satellites hits another satellite, hits another satellite, hits another satellite, and all of a sudden, outer space is closed to human beings. We simply cannot mop up the mess of all this debris traveling at 60, 70, 80,000 miles per hour orbiting the Earth. We're locked down onto the surface. And that could happen. And, and that's called a, a cascade event that we've been warning uh, the satellite community about. Uh, we know we have to maneuver the space station every once in a while to get out of the way of this debris and this material. And I'm not talking about objects the size of a, an automobile going by. The window on the space shuttle was two inches thick. It hit a piece of paint, a fleck of paint traveling at about 75,000 miles per hour. That was the size of the fingernail on your little finger. Yeah. It cracked the window of the shuttle. It hit so hard. So, wow. so that stuff out there is not benign. It's not poking along. It's moving. So when I hear all of these satellites that are going up and more and more and more, um, we're not facing the fact that we may lock ourselves in on the earth and space travel as we know it to the moon and beyond M may not happen if one of these cascade events takes place. Well, David, who regulates space in terms of that? I mean, can an Elon Musk, I mean, if you and I had enough billions of dollars, we could just shoot off satellites into space all we want. I mean, who, who, sure who, can. who, who authorizes it? I mean, just because he has the money and can do it, he can do it or does NASA or who, who's the final jurisdiction and that's the interesting question, isn't it? Because there's a lot of countries on this earth. I mean, who, who decides whether Elon Musk can put satellites into space? Elon Musk? Uh, uh, Elon Musk, apparently at this point. And um, he's not alone. I mean, Jeff Bezos wants to, to launch satellites out there, too, for communications and uh, uh, global ways to, for programming, for health. Uh, a lot of it is positive. But then you've got the Russians on the other side who uh, are crazy about what they're doing in outer space because what they're doing is they have anti-satellite weapons. And an anti-satellite weapon is put in place to knock out an opponent's satellite, communication satellite, visual satellite, spy satellite, so that if there ever was an escalating incident, that country would be blind, but they do it uh, the old crude Russian way. Uh, they uh, send up a satellite that's disguised as something else. It slowly moves into orbit near uh, its prey, whatever satellite it wants to knock out, and then it explodes. And all that debris is now traveling 65, 70,000 miles an hour through space in a huge debris field orbiting the Earth. And that's exactly what happened in the movie gravity when all of a sudden those debris started hitting other satellites and the field got bigger and bigger and just totally destroyed the space station wow i haven't seen that one yet but i i need to go check oh. that one out <laughs> oh, man i don't know how much my heart can take uh i know gravity you'll love it <laughs> oh boy now i want to get to this chapter on swallowed by a black hole which is i think next to the aliens one is one of my favorite chapters in here but David, back 
back when we were kids, were they talking about black holes? It seems to me that we've heard of black holes a long time. Have they always been kind of verifiable as they are now? W- weren't they kind of like theories for a long time? Like we didn't know if black holes were real or just some type of an, uh, an astronomy concept and idea and theory or have uh, tell me about this because this is the one i think i have the hardest time wrapping my head around because i don't quite understand how they work i know they eat everything that kind of gets sucked into them i don't know where they go the whole mind bending thing that you talk about is fascinating to me that a million years could go by on earth and it would be like nothing inside of one of these things how does that all work and is this is this real? I mean, black holes are real, right? It's not a theory anymore. It's actually provable. Yeah, it's absolutely provable. Uh, it began as a theory. It, and what they were doing is looking at the end of giant stars, how they would pass uh, out of this universe uh, as they ran out of fuel. And we were just recently talking about the supernova, how big, even out to the orbit of Jupiter, which which is, I mean, these are monstrous stars. But there are a few stars that are even larger than that. And what happens is when they run out of their fuel and they begin this collapse, because it's all of a sudden, it's like knocking the chair up from somebody standing up, trying to put a light bulb up. It it collapses and you fall to the floor. Mm -hmm. Well, the star begins collapsing and it begins heating up, but it was so big to begin with, it collapses faster and faster, and the explosion doesn't take place. It collapses in on itself and disappears into this black hole. Where it goes, we still don't know. I personally think it's Cleveland. But, <laughs> but, but and I love the Rock and Roll Hall, hall of Museum there. But <laughs> so these things collapse, and as they collapse, they move through space and they start pulling in debris around them as they pass through space, like they're feeding and they grow larger and larger in size. And so we can see them now. We, we had, they were theoretical for so many years, but now they usually occur with another star next to them. And we can see the material being oddly pulled right off that star and disappearing into this dark area. And we realize it's a black hole. Now, nothing can escape a black hole because the gravity is so strong, except x-rays. X-rays are highly energetic. That's why they pass right through your body. And we use them to look at your bones because they bounce off the the bones in your body Mm -hmm. and and we can see them. But so x-rays get out. So occasionally, With these X-ray telescopes, we can pick up a black hole in space and we can see that it exists. We can see these little X-rays coming from it. Every galaxy, every city of stars, we live in the Milky Way galaxy. It looks like two sombreros glued uh, glued together uh, uh, with each other. Every galaxy has a black hole in the center of it. We think actually the black hole was the first to form. And then all the debris and material around it eventually turned into the galaxy that we see. Uh, The Milky Way has a big black hole in the center of it. We have to wait till summertime till the constellation Sagittarius, the archer, is in the sky. And then you're looking right straight into the center of our Milky Way where the, the big black hole is. And occasionally we see it feed. We'll see energy come out of that area of the sky, which means a star or a planet or a solar system or or uh something fell into it when the x-rays x-rays were released so we know black holes are everywhere but we've always feared that one may come by and it would take us a while to see it because it's almost invisible and then suddenly there it is and it literally could suck up a star a planet anything in its way we call these rogue black holes and guess what this week astronomers found a rogue black hole 5,000 light years away from Earth, and uh, it's real. It's not going to affect us, but if it was on a collision course, look out. Uh, It it could consume the Earth. It could consume the entire solar system. It could consume our sun. So, Does it rip things apart, or do the things just get pulled in and they exist there, or what happens? Does it destroy them? They get pulled in and get completely ripped apart. They get stretched and their atoms ripped apart as you go inside the black hole. And where you go, we don't know. It's called a singularity, which is a really fun name. 
uh, but it means we simply don't know. All the laws of physics change, time changes. Uh, everything that, that we count on working here on Earth does not work inside of a black hole. But they're there, but they're there. So that's one of the marvelous mysteries. And, and certainly other planets have had black holes that came too close and adios, uh, gotta go. And they would have been pulled right into it. Wow. Now, your second to last chapter here, we're going to conclude with aliens here in a few minutes, but uh, the end of the sun. Now, I'm thinking, well, first of all, tell us how, how much longer you think the sun has. What is the, the, the calculation and how do we come to that calculation as to how many billions of years left the sun has before it, it burns out? Sure. It's pretty simple. You do it every time you go to the gas station and you figure, oh, man, my tank is almost empty. This is going to take at least 17 gallons, <laughs> maybe more. So stars are the same way. They, they have a certain amount of fuel that they uh, started with and they're going to burn through that fuel. They, they will not have a chance to pull over to the side of the road and gas up again. So we can take a look at the size of a star. We can take a look at the color of the star because the color tells us how hot they're burning, how fast they're going down the freeway before they run out of fuel. And that gives us an opportunity to take a look and uh, see how long they have. Our sun is going to live for four, about 14 billion years. We're halfway through that right now. We're at the 7 billion year mark. So we got a half a tank of gas. But that can be deceptive because even though you have a half a tank of gas, it doesn't mean that our sun's going to go on for another 7 billion years because as suns age, they get hotter. And our sun is going to slowly get hotter and hotter and hotter. And that means that things here on Earth are going to get warmer and warmer. Not to be confused with climate change, because we're doing that to ourselves with all the CO2 we put in the atmosphere. But eventually, it won't matter. Our sun is going to grow warmer and warmer and warmer. And the best estimate right now is that we have about one and three quarter billion years to go on earth where most of us are from and the sun will then be too hot. The oceans will evaporate. The lakes and rivers will evaporate and the earth will look like the Sonoran desert uh, from that point on at about 250 degrees in temperature. Wow. So we've only got 1.75 billion years to go. So spend it wisely. Man, so the Super Bowl, all that stuff's still okay. All right. It's anyway, okay, although those could be ninety <laughs> degrees in LA. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do you think? Let me ask you this. I, I guess there's no way to tell this, but just looking at human evolution already, one could make the argument: if we stay on the course that we're on, we won't have to worry about even a million years from now. We're going to wipe ourselves out long before a billion, you know, plus years come about. What do you foresee in your imagination of imaginations? Do you think? People like us are going to be talking on podcasts and saying, oh, my gosh, you know, uh, our ancestors talked about this being a billion years away or two billion years away. And now it's finally here. We're, we're living through it and we have to figure out what's going to happen next. Or you think my guess is, A, we either wipe ourselves out by then or a lot can happen in a couple of billion years. We'll already be colonizing hundreds of other planets and we won't have to worry about the sun burning out. Is that uh, which scenario do you think it is? Uh, I, I you don't think know. we'll be here as we know it now, or we're going to be so far advanced that it, the human race never ceases to amaze me <laughs> or its stupidity. Uh, I, it, it's like a balance. They weigh each other out. I'm going to guess looking at the history of the earth and how many life forms have been here and have gone that long before our sun heats up where it becomes way too hot for us to survive here. We will either have migrated. We will move further out into the solar system first. Mars will be wonderful. Uh, there'll be parties on Titan and Europa nonstop because those will be warmer and, and great places to be. And then we may reach for the stars. That would be my hope. That would be my dream of where the human species could go. Or... Since 99% of all the life that has ever existed on Earth in any form 
has disappeared and appears in the fossil records, we may be just part of that. It, it, we may be a, one of those great passing fanciful experiments Mother Nature went through and then after a while kind of soured on and said, okay, I think it's time to move on. Wow. That's pretty sobering stuff. Whenever we talk with you, we, I, I'm always amazed and my jaw falls to the ground, just the stuff that just all the endless possibilities of, of how everything as we know it could end, you know? Um, it, but, but, it's, but, but Spencer, everything has an end. Everything yeah. is a beginning. Everything has an end. Everything sure. has a middle. But we, we kind of pretend the end is, isn't inevitable, isn't part of the pattern. Um, and, and, and it's in everything that's around us. Even the universe will eventually end. Everything that we know will eventually go dark and come to an end. I mean, that's creepy, but it's true. Yeah, no, it's, and, and it's happened. I mean, we look at all the, um, the phases the earth has gone through and the extinctions and the mass extinctions and, you know, probably those creatures at the time, if they were sentient enough to think about it, which they probably weren't, never thought they'd go out of style, you know? And then that happened to them, and eventually, it stands to reason it could happen to, to us and everything as we know it. I love your final chapter in here, and that's the one that has captured the most imagination, probably next to like, you know, I remember back in the 90s, all the asteroid movies that came out and uh, Deep Impact and all those, uh, Alien Invasion. That, according to your book and according to most scientists, is probably the least likely way that uh, we'd bite it in the end, right? Is to have aliens come out and, and uh, attack us or engage in some kind of a, a space war with us? It was, and that's why I put it at the end. Actually, I, I debated whether I wanted to put that last chapter in there. Yeah. And uh, we went around with the publishers and said, oh, you absolutely have to put that in there because – it's so much in our psyche and it's so much in our entertainment and our thoughts about what would happen, you know, if they showed up, would we invite them to dinner or go hide? It's uh, and right now, I mean, look at television right now, all the invasion shows that you can pick up uh, on the different networks that are broadcasting it. It's, it's very much in people's minds. So I included it and put it in there and, and tried to give a rather realistic look and what the implications might be. Now, one thing I couldn't understand, and I went back and I felt like a dummy, like I was back in school again, rereading the textbook over and over again for the test the next day. Right now, I think I would fail the Fermi paradox. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Fermi? Yeah, you are. Tell me, tell us what the Fermi paradox is. That's in the chapter on the alien invasion. What, what exactly does that mean? Enrico Fermi, the father of the atomic bomb, um, was talking one day and he, he came to this conclusion. If the universe is teeming with life and many in this universe are as smart as us or smarter or thousands or possibly millions of years ahead of us with technologies, they should be here already. We should know about them. They should be part of our culture or we should in some way have been impacted by them and they're not here. So where are they? And wow. that's what Fermi put forth. Where are they? They should be here. Well, they could be octopus or uh, hummingbirds. Those are my <laughs> theories. I'm going to stick with those. I think hummingbirds, you look at a hummingbird and you're like, that thing has to be an alien. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, I, I love the octopus they, they're the ones that I, I love to watch underwater and play with because they'll play back with you they're like dogs they're very they really curious. are they really <laughs> are they're very curious and uh yeah they they are very alien like in in their uh composition and what they're capable of doing and in their their brilliance they're very smart but no. uh, <sighs> This alien invasion thing, I think, would unite us. I don't think anybody out there, if aliens showed up and knocked down New York City and then went on to uh, Buenos Aires to knock a few buildings out, anybody would say, oh, you know, this, I think this is made up by a political party. This is not real. This is not <laughs> real. <laughs> I don't think that would happen. That, that, would, that would unite us in a sense. But um, that, that, that depends if you put 
the personality traits of a human being into an alien's body? Would they be aggressive? Right. Would they be uh, warlike? Would they bring their own religion to this planet they decided we needed to join? <coughs> so I don't know. It's very fascinating to me. Um, well, thanks for this conversation and thanks for this book. I can't wait to talk with you the next time. I said that the last time and uh, I appreciate uh, all the, uh, I think I have a meteor coming through the, uh, the side <laughs> yard here. You hear that? It sounds like a meteor is coming through right in the middle of the interview. I'm oh, sorry. No. I was trying to avoid that. Uh, all f- full disclosure, that was not an asteroid or a comet or even a little bit of space junk. That's a septic truck coming to check. Our, our septic alarm went off in the middle of the night, and I thought it was an alien invasion, but it's just a septic alarm. So that that big truck had to go by just in the nick of time before we finished the interview. <laughs> I was crossing my fingers the whole time. We wouldn't hear any extra noise. I apologize for that. Um, this book is brilliant. I love it. And I'll be honest with you. When I saw the initial title and when you sent me this book, I was like, gosh, is this going to be depressing? You know, cosmic catastrophes and destruction of the earth and things. But I, uh, the aliens are coming to get me. Do you hear that? The, the tractor beams on David. Yeah. They're sucking me up into the ether here. Um, I swear to you, it's pulling up right outside the studio window. What are the odds of that? There's never been a truck parked outside the window, except when I'm talking with David Aguilar here. Um, no, I, I wasn't sure if it was going to be like a downer, but your books are just so inspiring. I love them, and I can't get enough of your input on this stuff and having you on as a guest. So you, as of right now, you're the only one I've ever had three times on, and I would love to have you on a fourth and a fifth and a sixth, and I, I have a stack of your I'm books blushing. here on my desk. I'm blushing right now. Let's do it. Well, let's I appreciate have, it. Let's, let's explore this universe and, and this crazy species called human beings. Absolutely. Now, tell us the best way to get a hold of you, because I know your books are all over Amazon. I don't know, as an author, if you have a preference that they go there or if they go to Aspen Skies, which is, uh, is that your official? It's uh, my official now. Just go to AspenSkiesOneWord.com okay. and drop us a note. Okay. Yeah. And you've got tours and events on there. You've got your bio, contact information, all your book links and stuff. I figure that might be the best place to send people, but uh, there's no shortage of ways people can get a hold of this book, which I highly recommend. Um, and it's stuff we have to think about. I, as I told you before in earlier interviews, David, I was, I was a lot more selfish in my younger days where I thought, actions didn't matter and what we do on this earth, you know, oh, come on, you know, it's just, it, it's, it's the insect on the elephant's back. But it really isn't. Everything we do has an impact on each other, on ourselves, and on the atmosphere, on the planet, on the climate. Everything that we do has an impact, uh, whether we like to think of it or not. We're billions of people on this planet, and we think oftentimes I'm just one person, so who cares? But you know, obviously, everyone's thinking that same way, right? Every all the billions of people on the planet think, "Eh, my actions don't matter," and then we end up in the mess that we're in. Well. Uh, that's one way to look at it. And, and again, because technologies change so quickly, technologies shape and change us. We think that we shape and change them. It, it goes both ways. And so it's a huge distraction. But as a scientist, as a naturalist, as an artist, I step back and, and I cruise the universe at night through my observatory and telescopes. But I step back and look at this planet look at the beauty, look at us, us humans here at this moment in time, grasping the beginning of our universe, how it came about, and the search for life out there. We are the most remarkable species that has ever walked this planet. I love dinosaurs, but humans are absolutely the most remarkable creature ever to appear on this planet. And so I I, I look at it with that value in mind, with that wonderment, with that joy, with that hope. Absolutely. And we have to put this disclaimer. He's not talking about LA Rams fans. Okay. He's talking about everybody else on the planet. (laughs) I'm just teasing. I don't have any skin in that game at all. I don't care who wins or loses, but anyway, (laughs) David, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for being with me. And as long as you were as well. And uh, I can't wait to talk with you again. Uh, Let's do it again, Spencer. Have a great afternoon. Well, thank you very much. We were talking with astronomer, artist, and author, musician as well. He's got many, many books that you can find at aspenskies.com. I'm Spencer Hughes. Thanks a lot for listening.